Okay, we are on to session four of the day. So this is food cities responding to the climate crisis. So this is all about how cities are responding to the climate crisis and climate change poses a serious threat to food systems and food security. At the same time, food systems are a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Agriculture uses up three quarters of the habitable land on our planet and it causes, as we know, deforestation, biodiversity loss. In this session, Dr. Alan Dango, where is Dr. Alan Dango? There he is, yeah. Um, we'll be talking about the challenges which city authorities face and discuss key food-related policy actions that authorities need to consider to the climate crisis. Then we're going to hear from delegates from Bangladesh, South Africa and Namibia. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Alan Dango, who is the Director of Climate and Health at the Wellcome Trust. And Alan actually joined the Wellcome Trust quite recently, January 2022, to lead an ambitious new climate and health strategy that seeks to put health at the heart of global climate change action. Dr. Alan Dango, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leila, and thank you all. I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, this is the moment where we find out that my laptop wants to reboot, but it, it hasn't. OK, great. OK, thank you very much. Um, delighted to be here today. Uh, huge thank you to Anna Taylor and the Food Foundation and the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office for inviting me to speak. Uh, and this is a really fantastic event. Uh, and what an exciting time to be in Birmingham and what an amazing city it is. And sparkling indeed, in the words of uh, Councillor Khan. I think sparkling it is fantastic. So um, I once went to the talk of a very, very senior civil servant who said, who said at the start of the talk rather, rather dis dispiritingly, I have 19 points I want to make. And then he started. I haven't got 19, uh, I've got 10. So uh, you can count them as we go through. Uh, so um, I'd like to start um, with the climate crisis. So the climate crisis is here. This is the front page of the free newspaper in London today. Uh, driest July since 1911. Uh, and we know that London is, the, the, U, the UK is not unique here. Uh, last week, uh, we had the hottest day on record in the UK. Um, and around the world, there's been some astonishing evidence of, uh, the, of, of the climate crisis. Uh, astonishing heat in India and Pakistan, floods in Australia, drought in northern Italy and South Africa, and rampant wildfires in Europe and North America, just to name a few uh, that have been in the news in the last month. So we cannot pretend that the climate crisis is not here already and is already having an impact. And the climate crisis is a health crisis. Fundamentally, it is going to have huge impacts on the health of people around the world. And we think about those health impacts in three different ways. We think about the direct impacts. So we could think about the impacts of heat specifically, and we've seen those impacts already recently, increased mortality resulting from heat, uh, and, 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 the, and the impacts of extreme weather events like droughts and floods on health. And then we see the impacts via nature, and I'll come back to this, but those, na those nature-based, those, those impacts via the ecosystem uh, are things like the changing distribution of infectious diseases. As the environment changes, so mosquitoes will live in completely different parts of the world, and that will spread diseases in totally different parts of the world. Uh, but also, of course, the food system and food production, which I'll come back to. And then the impacts on health via, the, via society. And if you think about this, uh, we've heard already about farmers in many parts of the world today uh, who will increasingly struggle to produce foods. That, of course, affects their livelihoods. That, of, of course, will affect health. Uh, we can, we can, I think we can be assured we will see significant migration globally. Uh, and, of course, with migration comes the breakdown of society and conflict. So the climate crisis is a fundamental health crisis, um, and it's here. 
we're currently at one and a half degrees hotter than pre-industrial levels. And we've already seen with just one and a half degrees of heating, what can happen. So despite our ambitious attempts to keep global heating below one and a half degrees, and the Paris Climate Agreement is, is our attempt, our global attempt to do that, we are currently on a path to heating of at least 2.7 degrees. 2.7 degrees heating on average is catastrophic because of course the world isn't, the world heats up in different ways, land heats up much more than water, and 2.7 degrees on average you can expect heat, heat increases of 5, 6 degrees in parts of the world and 10 degrees on the poles. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres himself said this is code red for humanity. I, this is very scary. So we've discussed, we've discussed today the need for healthy food cities, those that support the health in cities. And we've also just now discussed some sustainable food cities. How can we ensure to, that we reduce the environmental footprints of food consumption in cities? And we've heard some wonderful examples from around the world. Um, but something we tend to talk less about is the future of food and nutrition security in cities in an era of climate change. So the evidence from global agricultural modeling exercises is quite bleak. It's estimated from these global models that look at all of the evidence on agricultural production and the evidence of the changing climate, that there'll be about a 10 to 15% reduction in the yields of the major cereal crops under relatively middle of the road climate scenarios. There's less evidence on the impacts of climate changes on fruits, vegetables, and legumes. Uh, but, the, but it's pretty clear that if it's hotter and it's drier, there's increased salinity, increased levels of ozone, plants will grow less well, and yields will decline. And these impacts are not uniform. So we'll see some parts of the world where this is a sub substantially greater problem. And that, those parts of the world are much of Africa, much of South Asia, South America, Australia, and the South Pacific will feel the impacts the most severely. So the supply of nutritious food to cities with large and increasing problems is therefore a significant concern that we need to take much more seriously. And we've seen already the, the indications of what this could look like. And these are relatively trivial, but let me give you some examples. So there was a drought in Spain last year. There was no lettuce in UK supermarkets. There was a drought in Mexico two years ago. There were no avocados. Personally, I don't mind there are no avocados, but there were no avocados. So these are trivial examples, but they are just the tip of the iceberg. And you can imagine that with a global food system where we're entirely dependent or increasingly dependent on import of foods from around the world, when those parts of the world are affected by extreme weather events, by drought, or by, by declining yields, this will affect the availability of food, and especially in cities that are often highly dependent on a global food uh, uh, system. And of course, what this does a decline in the availability of food pushes up the prices of foods. And the prices of food, the most things that are most vulnerable, the fruits and vegetables, the most nutritious foods that we want people to eat more of, are the most at risk. So I ask you, how many cities, how many countries are planning, are actively planning for the impact of climate change on global food supply? How many cities are taking this as a fundamental question for the existence, for their existence? Climate change is also proceeding much faster than we previously thought. And who's ready? Cities must urgently act to think about how to ensure food supply, not just cereals, but also fruits and vegetables, so that food and nutrition security is maintained. And let me give you an example. In 2008 and 9, there was a sudden spike in the price of foods. In the, in, 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 the, in the price of a food basket. That, price, that spike occurred because of multiple things. One of them was an El Nino event, but there was also uh, a lot of uh, uh, trading of food, uh, which, which has subsequently been outlawed, but a lot of trading on, on, on food commodities. And that pushed up the number of undernourished people, as defined by the, by the Food and Agriculture Organization, to nearly a billion. And there were food riots 
in more than 30 countries around the world. So because if the price of bread rises and people can no longer afford to buy bread, people will, will riot, and quite rightly. So I've come here today not to scare you, although frankly, it's pretty scary. But I think what we need to do is we need to build a movement within cities across the globe that understand and urgently address this critical issue of ensuring food and nutrition security in the face of climate change. So there are a whole series of questions that I don't know the answer to, that nobody knows the answers to. What are the public sector policies that can protect cities and their population? What are the private sector actions that are needed? What can local communities do? What can local farming cooperatives do? Where are the innovations? How can we protect the most vulnerable people? How can cities adapt to both global and local climate change to ensure that they can provide healthy and nutritious foods to their growing populations? These are huge questions, and I'm afraid there are currently very, very few answers. Much of the research still needs to be done. And then, of course, when you have the findings, we also need to transmit that into policy action, which has its own challenges. Uh, as Leila introduced me, I'm now at the Wellcome Trust. I spent the last 20 years doing some of this research, although clearly not well enough, uh, at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I'm delighted now to be at the Wellcome Trust. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Wellcome is a large, independent, global health philanthropic foundation based in the UK. And we, uh, in our new strategy, which has just been launched, we recognise climate change as a major global health challenge. And our mission in the climate and health team is to put health at the heart of climate change action. So recognising that the climate crisis is a health crisis and health must be fundamental uh, to any actions. And we seek to transform the global support for research to drive action on climate change. We will be supporting at significant scale the conduct of new research on the sustainability and resilience of food systems, and we will have a focus on cities. So we seek to generate co-created with local, generate evidence that's been co-created with local policy stakeholders that can be used to drive the urgent action that is needed. We have a very active website. Please keep an eye on our website, welcome.org, to see the calls for research that we'll be putting out. Right, I think that's probably enough for me. I hope I haven't alarmed you too much, especially not in the run-up to lunch. But I hope I've provided some background for, the, for this is going to be a really important session where we will learn from our colleagues from Durban, Bangladesh and Windhoek about how their cities are responding to the climate crisis. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, thanks, Thank Dr. Chan. Thank you. I mean, you say, you hope it's not alarming, but it is alarming, and kind of rightly so. Um, the climate crisis is here. It's a code red for humanity. And the climate crisis is a health crisis. I think that's such a key point. Um, and you held up that newspaper, the, the, the driest July. I'm somebody who attempts to grow a few vegetables in my outside space. And so I feel like I'm acutely aware of, 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 of the weather. And I don't know if anyone remembers in the UK last year, April was the coldest and driest record, uh, April since records began. Who remembers a thing called April showers, right? That's not even a, like a thing anymore. Um, and you know, when you talk about building that cities have to, be, we have to build a movement within cities to address some of the huge questions that you mentioned there. I think that's really important. And so I'm, I'm so thrilled to have this excellent panel on stage with me. Um, I would like to introduce them now. I have Mr. Vio Jaia, sorry, Mr. Vio Jaia, head of agribusiness in Durban municipality in South Africa. We've got Ms. Samaya Binte Selim. Uh, Samaya is a researcher at the International Centre for Climate Change and Development in ba Bangladesh. And Mr. James Kalindu, lead manager at Social and Youth Development, Vintuk Municipality in Namibia. Thank you all for, for joining us. 
Um, yeah, we already have a round of applause. <laughs> Excellent. You haven't even done anything yet, so that's not bad. Um, but it is so lovely to have you all here. Um, Mr. Vuyo, I'm going to start with you. So, South Africa's government has declared a state of disaster in KwaZulu Natal Province, where Durban is, following the severe floods that happened in April. How did the city of Durban respond to that disaster, especially in relation to meeting the emergency food needs of the citizens? Oh, thanks, Leila. Um, I think before I can come to the response to the disaster, I think some of these things have been time in coming because I think we've been acutely aware of the climate change crisis that we are all living in. Uh, Durban as a city, we've signed a number of international declarations against climate change. We're part of the C40 cities. Uh, we've signed the Milan Food Pact as well. Um, and also as a city, we've just adopted our um, climate change action plan, which has got a number of pillars. Um, biodiversity management is one of them. Um, the city, 60% of our land mass within the municipality is called DEMOS. It's a shortened version of what it means. It's Deben Open Space Management. We try to keep it as, almost, uh, as open space as possible, promote biodiversity within that space, manage it. But unfortunately, only 25% of that is under conservation. Um, and also as a city, we're dealing with a number of things because we've got high influx of people into the city because it's a, one of the big cities in the country. It's attracting people who are looking for opportunities. So we have got a proliferation of informal settlements into these open spaces. Some of the open spaces are flat plains whereby we wouldn't encourage uh, any settlement into that, but we have informal settlement into that. Um, and then we're trying to reduce uh, dependence on um, private transportation so that most people can use public transport because it's one of the um, contributors of greenhouse emissions. And strangely enough, we have food security as one of the pillars of our climate change because it is important. It is also a contributor as well. Um, and also we are losing a lot of our good lands for productive capacity. So post the floods, I think there was a lot of devastation. Um, most of our infrastructure was damaged. I think the damage was estimated at 1 billion rands as it may, and that number continues to escalate. More than 40% of our roads were inaccessible. People couldn't move. Um, unfortunately, there was a high number of loss of life. Over 46 people died um, within that process. More than 2,000 homes were displaced. Um, and the municipality had to respond, and it had to respond quick. But one good thing uh, up, up about that disaster, uh, the state of disaster was declared fairly shortly because those things, they take a while because of bureaucracy. But we had a good response from private sector, civil society, and government. There was something that just worked. All sectors of society came to get together to provide relief for the humanitarian support which was needed because all of a sudden people who had homes suddenly didn't have them. There were public shelters which were provided, food supplies which were provided both by, by government, private sector and civil society and also international donations came to our aid and I think that is highly applausible and we acknowledge it very much because it made a big problem a bit of more survivable for the people who didn't lose their lives. And then secondly, um, as a municipality, we already do have some, we call them soup kitchens. Um, we have uh, 89 soup kitchens around the municipality whereby the municipality provides hot meals every day, especially nutritious meals. Um, because uh, food insecurity is a problem which we had even before the floods. It just got exacerbated by such. So that program was then strengthened so that it can be able to support in the short term those families who were affected by such. And also the government of South Africa in general does provide um, a program for young kids who are still at school, primary school. It's called a school nutrition program. In Durban, we've got over 200,000 kids 
who get provided hot meals at school every day. Because I think, as it was said by the first speaker, Mr. David, that you know, food is the first thing we need. You can't teach on an empty stomach. Uh, malnutrition also affects how we grow, and I think the panel discussion around nutrition spoke about that. So those were the short-term interventions which we have done. But I think for us as a municipality, it's taking us now to really look at our infrastructure upgrade as a municipality because our, our infrastructure is old as it is. And it was unable to carry the influx of the rain that came through. Um, so there is that problem which we need to fix. Uh, secondly, we need to improve um, local production as a municipality. More than 90% of our fresh vegetables come from outside provinces. We don't grow our own food. But I think that's just the nature of cities. Most cities don't grow what they consume. But in Deben, through trying to have and use these open spaces better, trying to promote more production in those open spaces, and also climate alleviation, there's a forestation program that the municipality has. So whenever we have our landfill sites coming to the end of their life cycle, we grow trees um, on top of that. And also one of the pillars of our climate action plan is um, waste management, whereby we really try to divert waste into those landfill sites, um, try to reuse that waste, recycle it, and some of the um, landfill sites which we have, we are able to harvest some of the methane and we're using that, that, that to power the electricity within the municipality. But I think one thing that is for sure, there's never going to be an answer which is linear to these things. And I think as you listen to all the talks, you understand that the, simply, the system by its nature is complex. And I think we need to embrace that walk into the program understanding that this is a complex system. Of course, the answers are never going to be linear. Uh, we just might have to understand that there are big challenges. We might have to prioritize where we can so that we can see short-term impact because impact encourages people who are solving the problem. Also, impact attracts more of the broader population to see what is the big deal because you still have communities who don't understand what is the big deal about this climate change. It's hot and then what? I mean, this is God and he's doing whatever he's doing, but it does not change behavior. But a little bit of impact as we come up with the solutions, it helps us win and create better public awareness and starts to make these conversations more normal and move them away from being uh, too theoretical or too academic, whereby an average person does not see the role that they play. Like an example, we've got a lot of street traders within the municipalities. They are regulated, they do get permits, but they also contribute a lot to waste that happens within the municipality. We've had to learn to use them as ambassadors, provide better facilities for their waste disposal. And also, because before we, when, when we were not doing that, some of the informal traders would dispose some of their waste on our stormwater drainage system. Whenever there's a little bit of rain, the stormwater can cope, but a little bit of education, and they get to see the benefit of that. But I think our biggest takeaway is that I think the system is very much complex. Um, and one thing and a great learning that uh, as a city I want to say that we've got from a little bit of time that we've been interacting with the Food Foundation is to learn, uh, is to st start a food policy. And I think for me, when we started hearing cities and the food policies that they had, we started seeing agriculture as a system as well. It's part of the system. Before then, we would focus on enterprise development, helping small-scale farmers to improve efficiency, profit, access to markets, uh, household poverty alleviation, help households get uh, nutritious food. But I think once we started to see the food as a system, it starts to make sure that we bring our colleagues who are in the climate change department on board. Our town planning colleagues, they also start to come on board and our engineering because the way we build for the future 
has to be more resilient than how we have done in the past. Thanks. Mm, thank you. Well done, yeah. Thanks so much, Fuya. Yeah, I mean, I think a common theme is that it's a complex system, complex answers, which we're still sort of searching for. And it, you know, it, 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 it involves a lot of moving parts and, and again, buy-in from the public or the public understanding uh, uh, and the education piece around that, which can then sort of um, trigger uh, change further, further up the chain. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Samaya, hi. So, not too dissimilar to Durban, 7.2 million people suffered record-breaking floods in Bangladesh, I think just last month. Um, the death toll was uh, smaller, it was about around 68, versus a quite large death toll in, in, in Europe, in Germany, uh, um, who also uh, experienced record-breaking floods. So what lessons would you say that the international community can learn from Bangladesh's experience of disaster management and how are cities developing their, their food strategies to cope with these disasters? Okay, so thank you first. So uh, when uh, like talking about Bangladesh, uh, it's very climate um, vulnerable country and we have lots of natural calamities uh, and which is like uh, climate, re uh, climate change is like uh, pressing pressure on us again for the southern part of Bangladesh and also the northern part of Bangladesh. So there are some geopolitical issues with uh, other countries that we are sharing the boundaries with. And there are some like climate change impacted on the Nepal and, uh, and India also like effect on us because at the, as the downstream rivers are also like going to the Bay of Bengal. So it's very like complicated system. So as, um, uh, the, as per the question, so Bangladesh is really, the people of Bangladesh are very like climate change adaptive uh, mentality people. So we are like coping every and each day. So it's not very new for us uh, to like cope with floods. And from where the learning begins uh, at the Cedar and Isla in 2007 and 2009, we actually learned from that event so much because we had a lot of casualty in that time. Uh, and also we were like devastated economically too, uh, specifically for the southern region as it's the size of the Bay of Bengal. So from that, uh, from that uh, cyclone and flood, people are learning to like cope with the warning systems and cope with the how we can like cope with and adapt with the disaster uh, by locally led adaptation and community based adaptation. So uh, what actually happens in Silet, like the uh, northeastern part of our country in the last month, uh, people actually abide by the warning systems so much that they like started to taking shelter uh, before, the store, uh, before the flood started. But there are some difference between the southern part, part of um, area and the northern eastern part. Northeastern part people are normally um, usual to the flash flood. But this time the flash flood is not likely to be the flash flood, but it's that stagnant water for 15 or uh, 15 days or for one month. So people started to like uh, take their shelter before the flood started so that the casualty are less. So. From the cedar and isla, when the people learn that, and people not actually uh, focus on their resources in that time of the uh, disaster or climate uh, change, uh, any any calamities of this time, uh, rather they just focus on themselves to like uh, get their life uh, uh, to take take in the taken shelter so and that's one of the learning uh, from how like people of bangladesh are uh, coping with the disaster uh, but uh, i must say that if this would happen in the southern part of bangladesh the casualty would be less than this time uh, what happens in the northern northern stern because they are more uh, like cope with uh, this type of things, this type of warnings, which is not like uh, really uh, like uh, practical for the northeastern part of the country, as I've said that, that they have mostly faced the flash flood. 
So, um, and if I uh, talk about the perspective from food, food system and food security, uh, so I've, I have studied uh, specifically two of the secondary cities in Bangladesh, which is one of the uh, cities in Mongla and one of the other cities city is Noapara. So, Mongla is very climate vulnerable uh, area for Bangladesh and for it's like hotspot for the climate change uh, effects. Uh, there are like salinity intrusion, there are like uh, the floods, there are like cyclones, but we have Shundarbans beside Mongla and that is the natural shield for us uh, to save Mongla and the other uh, adjacent area. So what uh, is possibly um, um, are good for the municipality of these areas are coping um, that could be like stated in three or four points uh, broadly. So one is the in Bangladesh the municipality doesn't work like the the other countries. It is like uh, individual um, individual body and it has to like cope with and adapt with the government administration which which is based on the sub district so uh, one of the uh, one of the coping strategy for the food system should be that the collaboration between the municipality and the sub district level administration and the second second um, possible solution should, would be the uh, collaboration with the ngo and government organization together to work for the food system as i have mentioned that uh, in our municipality there is no specific um, unit for like uh, for uh, food system or food uh, food policy or food security so that should be implemented and number third is which is the most important thing specifically for bangladesh as people are like adapting uh, like in regular basis so we have to like build the capacity of the farmers and also each and every person uh, who are uh, involved in the uh, food processing because uh, we all need food that is the most important truth so people should be engaged in food system food policy as like as people are like coping uh, every day with disaster in Bangladesh or the climate change in Bangladesh so that people can learn about and understand the value of food and how this system works and how they can contribute from their selves uh, in the system of municipality or sub-district. So um, these all should be included. Uh, in Bangladesh, we have like struggled to cope with the sub-district level administration and municipality to work together because there are some, uh, there are some rules and regulations to collaboration so uh, in some cases municipality uh, municipality have like said that, that they, they don't actually uh, do what they want to do uh, because of the subject level administration so we have to like work on these two and it could be uh, with the help of uh, NGO so that they can just keep them in collaborative works and also uh, they have to like there should be some policy changes or inclusion of policies that uh, could be initiated by the municipality so as per my understanding as i'm a researcher i'm not a municipality person so this was my observation according to my study thank you so much mm -hmm. thanks samaya and I think we can say Bangladesh is, is like on the front line of climate change. And as you say, because I mean, they're already like very much in it and have been for some time. And so they're, they're having to adapt. And so I think there's a lot that we can learn from Bangladesh. I'm actually an ambassador for a development charity called Practical Action. And they do a lot of work in uh, Bangladesh where but basically they help people living on the front line of climate change to sort of, uh, especially farmers. To, to, to improve their own situations, to elevate themselves out of poverty. And one of the things that I keep reading about, all these innovative ways that farmers are growing in Bangladesh to, to adapt to the, the floods and then the salinity of the water, like floating, um, floating farms. Yeah, growing crops on like a bed of, I think, water hyacinth, something like that, which was like so cool. And then... Um, planting squash in the sand drifts that are left behind after floods because you can just make the hole and then put the compost in it and otherwise that land would not couldn't be grown so um it was fascinating to hear from you thanks so much for that um and mr james kalindu hi hi so last year um the un warned that southern africa is in the throes of a climate emergency hunger levels in the region 
previously unseen. Uh, Vintec has been implementing a number of innovative interventions to support citizens to grow and access food. Please, could you give us some examples of what's going on there? Well, thank you very much, Laila. And Thanks. good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, maybe just a quick background. Urban agriculture is relatively new on the agenda of the city of Windhoek, as old as five years now. Uh, I think there were various reasons as to how and when we came to the realization that we need to upscale agriculture in the city. It is the capital city of the country with 2.5 million. Uh, Windhoek has about 400 plus people during the day. Oh, well, at night it becomes less mm. because we are sandwiched by smaller cities that come in and do business in the day and go back in the night. Uh, it is a desert country. Climate change is, of course, presenting a fundamental problem, uh, geopolitically speaking. Uh, we have been hard at work as a municipality by creating environments that are enabling. Uh, we use our council to make approvals for certain proposals. First of all, to avail land for urban agriculture. And, first of, and secondly, to also ensure that our mainstream residents are aware of the fundamental problem that we have. With the council resolution, we were able to then go out there and repossess land that was previously leased to individual farmers. And then we went out there and said, as your contract expires, we will need the land back for the purposes of creating a community garden. In response to, first of all, we've had a drought recurring for five years, and I think some other regions are, are not spared from that. And obviously, with the visit of COVID some two years ago, we were forced as a council to start thinking outside the box by now engaging the young people, the general residents of the city, to first of all understand that you do not only need to produce food in the rural areas you could do production at the back of your house you could do production on the rooftop you could use permaculture as a method of cultivating and then we had to round them up and give them necessary training and of course we couldn't have done that without the good samaritan who would then come in and support uh, recently, we've just implemented a massive program or project of constructing a garden on a piece of land measuring 2,000 hectares with the sponsorship of the UNDP and, and other learning institutions that are providing the technical know-how. Uh, we have been hard at work as well to make sure that um, the way we utilize our water becomes something that must change. We have gone to the point of creating two mainstream of water supply that is using the fresh water that we can consume from a tap. And by the way, Windhoek City reclaims about 60% of its water. Uh, so that in a way tells us how dire the need is for water. And then we use fresh water for our gardens. We do use semi-purified water. And of course, we have gone outside and started to do things differently by drilling for water at the depth of 100 to 200 meters in order for us to be able to sustainably supply water to our gardens. What we are doing with our allo allotments of land is to classify our users or participants youth, the disabled people, or people living with disabilities. And then we would look specifically on programs that are catering for women. So that is another stretch, a strategy we have actually employed in the city of Windhoek. From the onset, five years ago when it came on our agenda, 
we had adopted the multi-sectoral approach. Government is on board. Civil society organizations are on board. I've just mentioned the generous support of the UNDP. And we have had our communities rally behind the municipality in terms of getting to do uh, agricultural programs or projects. We are in the process of changing our laws, the bylaws, to allow people, for example, to start harvesting rainfall water at a household level. In the past, the laws would not allow you to erect a tank to collect the water that falls on the rooftop of your own house. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, in the new laws, we're going to have to change that. Uh, of course, terms and conditions apply. And uh, we've also been encouraging people to do first at school. The young people, are, we catch them whilst they are young. Regardless of how, how big or small your property is, we are saying the laws must change to the extent that uh, you be given the right to use part of your property, maybe to grow one tree of citrus. COVID taught us we need more lemons, <laughs> oranges. And uh, we are saying, let it begin from home. And the schools are on board. Uh, Windhoek has about 40 schools that are at secondary level. And all the schools have been brought together, of course, with the representation of two to three kids per school. So we are using the kids as ambassadors. And at the community level, we have now erected three gardens which are belonging to the city. We facilitate the development. We train the people on basic agricultural methods. We have the permaculture way, which works well with us being a desert country. We grow veggies without necessarily disturbing the environment on which we are. And we've also been uh, trying to bring in the high learning institutions. We are hosting two or three major universities and we have signed a memorandum of understanding with a lot of them to ensure that they train our people and that we have the state-of-the-art knowledge on how we should be resilient about growing food in a desert country, a country that has also been impacted by COVID. Majority of our food or a good percentage of our food comes from our neighboring South Africa. Uh, we're talking about fruits and veggies. So the gardens that we have produced deliberately, we went for a fruit garden, fruit tree garden. The trees that were grown three years ago, they have started to bear fruits now, which is good. And we have specifically made allotments to, to make sure that we have a garden with the classes that I've just mentioned. Uh, it's very important for us to know that how many of the young people in the city are being impacted? How many of those who are living with disabilities can grow and thrive through that hardship? And then we look at women. And women, we also look at those who are probably pregnant or those who are breastfeeding, because we always assume that uh, they are the most vulnerable in the society. So the gardens are designed on voluntary basis, but of course using the community-based principle. You volunteer your service after public announcements, and the demand has been very overwhelming. And uh, with the technological advancements, we realize that we're going to have to put our gardens on the off-grid method, meaning we do not need power-generated electricity. We have drilled boreholes that are supposed to only run on solar. All the farms are from the gate to the production level. Everything is based on solar, more so in view of the fundamental problems that are presented by climate change. And the city also being forward looking, we created a desk that looks only at climatic changes across the globe, and specifically for Windhoek. So we have had innovative ways of irrigating. We use drip irrigation. And I mentioned permaculture. 
those of you who may be familiar will agree that it's a way you farm in, in a it's, it's quite kind of dirty way but you grow everything you don't disturb the ecosystem you use the insects to, to deter other insects from destroying your veggies you, you don't change the flow of water you, you just let it go and, and we have also because of high rate of evaporation it's quite hot we have tried to improvise by um, bringing green nets for our gardens one to, to, to deter insects secondly also to reduce the level of evaporation and we've also been very careful that being a desert country we have a lot of runoff water to the sea Namibia is on the coastal area of Atlantic Ocean and we are sitting on about 1,600 meters above sea level which gives us that disadvantage that every drop of water we get it has a tendency to run as quickly as possible to the sea and then you don't make use of it and the laws say you may not intercept the water flow except if the policies are changed you may not erect roof tanks or capture the water that comes from the rain so we are looking at as my brother here from south africa said we are in the process of developing a window based urban agriculture and nutrition system policy and we are hoping that with the support from the good samaritans and of course the expertise and experience from other countries we will be able to craft our own urban and urban agriculture and nutrition system for our people it has been a bit of a, a, a challenge uh, to, to come to where we are more so with the COVID that had presented itself on our doorsteps. Literally for the past year, it was hard to procure services. It was hard to bring good numbers of people to a meeting. But we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel now that we are able to go out there and, uh, and produce. The food that is produced from these gardens, firstly, the formula works like the people that work on the ground have the benefit to have food on their table. The surplus you give to your neighbor. If the surplus, you look at the charitable organizations like the old age homes. Winduk feeds about 300 to 400 children a day uh, at a certain place. And of course, we've got the school feeding program to make sure that the kids are well fed. Uh, I think one of the panelists mentioned here that we have an issue of kids maybe return, uh, having re to, to retard if they do not have the right food. And we've moved away from just the food pro provision. We are now carrying food with, but we have to make sure that this food is nutritious. Uh, we have to make sure that the dad of our children is such that it's nutritious, it has a fruit, it has a glass of milk for them to be able to, to concentrate in schools. And, and we are also encouraging uh, school kids to not only eat whatever is presented in the supermarkets. And, and, and uh, we discourage people bringing different types of food for uniformity. Some can afford two bananas, some won't. So we, we make sure that the school feeding program is for everyone that has a chance to benefit from it. Uh, we also don't leave out our elderly people in their homes. We have, soup, uh, I mentioned soup kitchens. We have old age homes that we run and they do get a fraction of what is produced at these gardens for their own consumption. Uh, the temperatures have been very much harsh. Uh, we would be getting anything between 17 degrees to 33, maybe not as hot as it was here last week, but for a country that is already dry, to be on an average of 17 to 38, it's quite, quite high. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, one of the learned speakers here mentioned that uh, one degree 
increase is already disastrous. Imagine if we pick it to, we push it to two, to two degrees, mm. it will be very, very difficult for, for, for us to, to cope with. Um, I think I think I think there is a lot more to say about what you are doing. But however, I am also conscious yeah. all the talk of food. We are we are uh, standing between people and lunch. Uh, but James and to the whole panel, thank you so much. What a fascinating discussion.